This uh, is a project that we did with Titouan Carret from the University of Paris-Saclay. Uh, some of the work I did during my PhD in Paris and at Lorient and Nancy, um, but now uh, the, the work was finished at the University of Edinburgh. Um, it's had various input from, from different people in the ZX community as well. Uh, so diving straight into the subject matter with a rapid introduction to uh, quantum computing with qdits or qpits in this case. Um, what we're interested in doing in this article is uh, lifting the zx calculus uh, which uh, applies at least or in almost all articles which have been published to this point to the setting of qbits or two-dimensional quantum systems to the setting of qpits or p-dimensional quantum systems um, and the state space of a qubit, unsurprisingly, is modeled by a uh, p-dimensional Hilbert space, uh, which has, uh, which we can view as c to the d. Um, and we decompose any state in this p-dimensional Hilbert space along a uh, computational basis, which we label with the elements of the uh, group of arithmetic modulo p. So here. Um, so in this article, we impose always that P should be a prime number, and uh, there are a number of implications of this which are not really clear in this talk, although it is important, and at the root of all of this is that it makes this group of arithmetic modulo P into a field with the usual operations. Now, uh, moving on to manipulate the state of uh, a qubit and the, the sort of operations that we're going to try and axiomatize through this calculus are uh, a handful of fairly standard gates, which are the generalization of uh, the, their qubit counterparts. So we have uh, Pauli gates, which are uh, somewhat straightforward generalizations of the qubit Pauli gates. The uh, Z Pauli is multiplication by a diagonal phase in the computational basis uh, by a uh, weighted phase here, which is a pth root of unity weighted by x, the label of the computational basis, which we're going to note omega in the rest of the talk. And then the x Pauli operator is just translation through the uh, basis elements in the uh, computational basis. Uh, having constructed Z and P, then we write any generic Pauli operator to be um, any ordered product of these uh, X and Z operators, now weighted by uh, our elements A, B of our uh, field. Uh, these two Pauli gates are uh, connected by a uh, Hadamard gate or uh, a finite Fourier transform, uh, which uh, maps us between the, the bases of both of these two uh, Pauli operators, just as in the uh, qubit case. We have a generalization of the CZ gate or controlled phase, which is also a multiplication by a, P, a weighted P of root of unity, uh, which acts on two qubits uh, with the corresponding weights on the phase. And then we also need uh, the phase gate, which um, is, might not necessarily be completely obvious from this uh, uh, presentation of it, but it is a generalization of the qubit phase gate, at least in how it relates to the Pauli operators as a, an element of the Clifford group, as we'll see in a second. Now, one sort of key, or one difference of these, these gates with the qubit case is that the operators are no longer self-inverse as they are in the qubit case. In fact, uh, for the Pauli's, the phase, and the control Z, you need to apply them P times before you get back to an identity operator. And uh, maybe m sort of something which has more of an impact on the calculus, the Hadamard or Fourier gate needs to be applied four times uh, before you get back to an identity operator. Um, so what is the stabilizer fragment for uh, qubits? Well, if you recall from the qubit case, the stabilizer fragment is the fragment that you get if you have access to the initialization of Pauli eigenstates. You can apply Clifford geometries, and you can do measurements of Pauli operators, or in the case of a ZX calculus, you can uh, project onto the eigenstates of Pauli operators. Um, so in the, the p-dimensional case, we're going to do exactly the same thing. Recalling that the Clifford group on n qubits is also going to be the normalizer of uh, the group of Paulis, 
in the unitary group acting on the cupids. Um, and so we get a, a Clifford fragment or stabilizer fragment, which is very analogous to the qubit case. Now, one uh, difference in, to the qubit case is that in uh, prime dimensions, you can give a, a very nice presentation of the Clifford group in terms of uh, the representation of a group, which I've written here, the representation of the affine symplectic group uh, plus a phase. Um, and I won't give you the, the, the specifics of this, but the upshot is that you can uh, think of any Clifford unitary as uh, a symplectic matrix plus a translation plus a global phase. Okay, so uh, this is the stabilizer fragment of quantum mechanics. Um, there have been, for the qubit case over the years, a sort of sequence of papers uh, on completeness results for the qubit stabilizer fragment, uh, starting with uh, Miriam's uh, 2014 article um, and sort of culminating in uh, the uh, paper that they have with uh, their student, Tommy McElvin, that he presented on, I think, the first day of this conference. Um, now, the axiomatization now for the, the, the uh, qubit case has been reduced down to, I think, this pretty clean set of rules, of which there are seven. Um, but there are a couple of features uh, which are rather nice, I think, about this presentation. Uh, the first is that um, it is, uh, it is a, a calculus where we have this only connectivity matters rule. That is, you can treat any of the diagrams in the calculus formally as graphs, dragging any of the uh, vertices or spiders around uh, doesn't change their inter the interpretation of the diagram in, in terms of quantum mechanics. Uh, and the second feature is that it's particularly easy in this presentation to see what the uh, Clifford fragment corresponds to. So you simply take where alpha and beta in the sort of fully universal calculus are any uh, angle mod 2 pi. Uh, for the stabilizer fragment, you just allow only angles which are integer multiples of pi over 4. Um, in terms of uh, higher dimensional quantum systems, uh, there has also been a, Q, a completeness result in the case of Qtrits by uh, Hani Wang. Um, but uh, in formulating this calculus, uh, essentially I think both of these features were really lost. Um, firstly, uh, in the, the Qtrit case, you have this, this complete axiomatization, but um, you now uh, have to be rather careful about which angles you specifically allow. In the Q-trick case, this is not uh, too much of a problem, but it doesn't generalize uh, beyond uh, q -tricks. I think you already in the, in, uh, the case of dimension five, uh, you can no longer allow uh, all uh, integer multiples of uh, pi over five or pi over 10, I guess, um, if, uh, you want to recover the stabilizer fragment. Um, there are somehow relations between the different angles that you need to allow for the different uh, uh, parts of your rotation, um, which are not essentially very clear in the calculus. And then secondly, in this calculus, um, you, we've lost the, the only connectivity matters uh, meta rule. And so you, ha you end up with these, what I, I think of rather vicious inequalities, especially if you're used to making arguments in the ZX calculus uh, and hand waving around these moving despite it's very easy, I expect, to stumble into, into uh, missing one of these and screwing up the, the proof. Now that's not to be sort of to completely disparage uh, Hyony's result. Uh, if anything, uh, it's very nice that he managed to prove this despite these difficulties and the proofs becoming much harder, I think. Uh, than the qubit case, and also uh, it gave me a lot of confidence that the, the, the sort of similar kind of ideas would work for proving uh, the, the general case if we can fix some of these, uh, these issues. Okay, so let's get into the, the actual calculus which is in our paper. Um, the, the calculus is generated unsurprisingly by uh, a pair of a green and red spider, and we also decided to include the, the Hadamard as a generator. Uh, we define sequential and parallel composition in essentially the usual way. We plug output wires of one spider into the inputs of the next, and uh, parallel composition is defined 
uh, by juxtaposing diagrams vertically. Um, I think really the, the only uh, thing which is worth pointing out at this point on this slide um, is the nature of the, the phase or label of the spiders. Now, um, as you see, we no longer have uh, spiders which are parameterized by rotations or, or angles, but instead by a pair of elements of our finite field. Um, and what we've essentially done here, um, although it's not really going to be apparent, is we've split off the uh, symplectic matrix part uh, from the, the translation part into two sort of separate subgroups of the phase group. Um, and then the, the global phase part needs to be tracked uh, separately in a, in a parallel diagram. Um, now, the quantum mechanical interpretation of these uh, generators is given as follows. Um, I'm using this notation here, uh, where's my laser? This, this notation here, um, for representing the eigenbasis of the Z operator um, and correspondingly for the X operator. Um, and so there are a couple of things which I'd like to bring your attention to here. The first is that uh, we have this relation between these uh, labels or these phases and an actual parametrized phase uh, for the rotation in terms of a quadratic polynomial. Um, then uh, the, I think the uh, green spider takes more or less the form you would expect, but um, it's important to point out that the uh, red spider is no longer diagonal in the conjugate basis. Um, it is a monomial matrix in the, in the uh, conjugate basis. And this is uh, one of the sacrifices that we have to make to recover this only connectivity matters uh, meta rule. Um, so uh, one other thing that I'd like to point out is that we have this additional factor 2 to the minus 1 in uh, the phase of our spiders. And this is um, essentially a matter of convention. It cleans up a few of the, the axioms, uh, especially in the scalar fragment that I'm not going to have any time to talk about. Um, so finally, uh, this first uh, uh, interpretation is actually a definition for Hadamard. And then from the others, we can deduce that we recover the Hadamard, the phase gate, and the CZ gate. And it turns out that these three gates are enough to generate the Clifford unitaries in p dimensions. And so we have a calculus which is universal for um, the Clifford or the stabilizer fragment of p dimensional quantum mechanics. OK, so on to axiomatization. Um, we first have a set of structural axioms, which are, uh, for at least the top two rows, mostly what you would expect. Uh, we have the usual rules for swapping wires and swapping diagrams through wires, uh, and as well as the usual rules for the cup and caps and string pulling equation and so on. And then we have this sort of last row, um, which is the uh, condition that Titoin called flex symmetry. That is, if you take any generator here, G, other than the swap, um, turn it into a state, and then apply any uh, permutation sigma written in terms of the swaps, then this should leave the state invariant. Um, and this rule is enough to recover this uh, only connectivity matters meta rule um, and allows us to treat our uh, diagrams as graphs again. And this is uh, nice both from a, a, a sort of practical doing proof yourself perspective, but I think also it means that formalizing uh, these rewriting uh, theories over these calculi are quite a lot simpler. Um, and then we have uh, what I really think of the axiomatization of the calculus itself. Um, so I've, I've removed the scalar fragment, which makes the axiomatization considerably more complicated because there's just no, no time to go into that, and I'm not sure how interesting it is. Um, but uh, we have uh, a bunch of rules which I think are, are pretty natural. We have a spider fusion rule, which is um, because of this axiomatization of the phase as polynomials, we just sum the coefficients of the polynomials to get uh, the fused spider. Um, we have a, uh, a rule which I call the characteristic rule. Um, then this is simply uh, a rule that picks out the dimension p in the unlabeled or phaseless calculus. Uh, we have the Vigeber rule on a couple of red and green emulation rule, elimination rules, uh, which I think are, are pretty expected. Maybe the only uh, unexpected 
thing is that the uh, red spiders are not uh, trivial, or the, the sort of red one-to-one -one, uh, spiders are not trivial in the calculus, uh, but you need to apply two in a row to get uh, an identity wire. Uh, we have a copy uh, rule, which here uh, is used to copy uh, the translation part of the, uh, the spiders, uh, which corresponds to the Pauli fragment. So essentially we have a Pauli copy rule uh, here. Uh, we have a color change rule, which I think is unsurprising. And then we have a handful of rules which are really axiomatizing the, uh, the Clifford group on one qubit. Um, and all of these rules have, uh, I think, more intuitive uh, explanations in terms of uh, the affine symplectic uh, presentation of the group. Um, but I didn't really have time to present that, and so I haven't really written the uh, corresponding interpretations here. Um, but all of this is in the article. Okay, so with uh, this axiomatization, we have a cactus which is sound, thank God, universal and complete for uh, the stabilizer fragment in uh, odd prime dimension. Uh, and what that means is that uh, if it's not entirely clear, we can uh, derive any equality of uh, stabilizer operations simply diagrammatically, and these rules are sufficient to do this. Okay, um, so we, we have essentially a cactus which is uh, pretty compact. Um, uh, I suppose a, a quick uh, comment about this is that uh, the, uh, there's probably room to do uh, quite a lot better. I expect that some of these rules are redundant, but the uh, proofs from the qubit case that simplify the calculus uh, down from, from this sort of axiomatization don't really necessarily apply, or at least not straightforwardly. Um, so there is, I think, uh, uh, a margin for improvement, despite the fact that I think it's already uh, pretty nice and simple. Okay, and then there's a long list of things that I don't really have time to talk about in, uh, in this talk. Um, we have in the article a, um, a section on, on meta rules that we can recover from the, uh, state, the, the uh, original calculus. So we have a version of um, the, the meta rule for spider wars um, because it gets a little bit more complicated. You can only uh, cut P wires with the characteristic rule. And so it gets a little bit more complicated there rather than cutting two wires in the qubit calculus. Um, there is also a version of the color change rule, which um, itself is considerably, I mean, a, a little bit more subtle than the qubit case, mostly because of the fact that the antipodes are no longer trivial, and uh, the Hadamard gate also is no longer its own inverse. So you have to take account for this when you're doing this color change rule, um, which makes it a little bit more complicated than just flipping the color of every spider. You also have to sort of add in antipodes and, and change the signs of phases. Um, then very briefly, because of this spider rule no longer allowing us to eliminate all but one edge, we have some meta rule, some, some, some sort of syntactic sugar, which allow us to, to represent uh, multiple edges, which we call multipliers, and essentially a version of the, uh, the trivial version of the matrices, or one, one uh, wire version of the matrices introduced by uh, Fabio Zanazzi for uh, graphical linear algebra over ZP. Uh, we have a flex symmetrization of multipliers because the multipliers are uh, not, unfortunately, flex symmetric, and this allows us to uh, give uh, a sort of nice presentation of graph states in the calculus uh, and sort of all of the rules that you would expect from graph states, such as the stabilizers, local complementations, uh, local Clifford operations, which preserve graph states. Um, and then uh, we also have a completeness result for the scalar fragment, uh, which, which sort of needs a handful more equations, like I was saying during the, the axiomatization slide. Um, so just finally, I think one thing that is rather nice in the calculus and, and also a pretty straightforward uh, conclusion from it is that um, using a, another construction that, that T1 came up with, we can uh, lift the calculus to mixed state stabilize the quantum mechanics using the so-called discard construction, which gives a, a complete uh, calculus for the CPM category of the stabilizer fragment. 
Um, and by the work of uh, Cole Comfort and Alex Hissinger, uh, this in fact gives us um, a, a, an, author, an alternative interpretation of our diagrams um, in uh, a category of affine coisotropic relations over the finite field ZP. Um, and so this is uh, obtained essentially as the unique uh, interpretation, oops, unique functor up here that makes this diagram commute. Um, because they worked in the scalarless fragment of the, uh, the ZF calculus, we have to quotient by an additional rule that gets rid of all of the non-zero scalars to get this, uh, this commuting diagram. Um, okay, so um, there are a number of, of, of course, obvious uh, questions which are left open for future work. Um, I already mentioned that I think there's probably quite a lot of room for improvement in terms of the axiomatization itself. Um, and then, of course, the, the sort of questions that, that uh, many people, I guess, are asking in the ZX community is, can we do uh, a complete calculus for all uh, the, the whole fragment in prime dimensions? This is probably going to be pretty difficult. Um, maybe more tractable is the, uh, the calculus for stabilizer theory in non-prime dimensions. There's some nice group theory there which might be uh, usable, but it's, once again, more complicated than the uh, p-dimensional or prime-dimensional case. And with that, um, I'm happy to take any questions you have. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Questions? So thanks for the nice talk, Robert. Um, if I take P equals 2, uh, then this is then this is different from qubit stabilizer theory. Yes. Uh, but is it equivalent to the presentation given by Miriam and uh, Duman? It's not. It's not. So I should have. I, I, I forgot to mention. It should be an odd prime number. Um, the the point is that if I go all the way back to this uh, this bit, um, you can. Um, you can probably recover the qubit case if you just take a single label, uh, which is an element of Z4. Um, but there is a, a difference. I'm talking, I'm talking about the toy theory, not stabilizer. Ah, the toy theory. Yeah. Um, I think that you would recover the toy theory. I, to be honest, I've not really put any thought into it. Uh, but yeah, I think you would recover the toy theory here. Okay. Because it's just uh, yeah. essentially linear algebra in, in the symplectic it's setting, symplectic. right? Yeah. Kind of a variation on Alex's question, where he fixes the field to be F two. If you fix it to be R, can this can you interpret like Gaussian uh, stabilizer circuits? Um, you can. I mean, I think you can probably do. You can do some of it. The problem is you still don't have these uh, these uh, cups and caps that are always problematic for the the, the, the sort of infinite dimensional setting. Um, you you can you can still get the um, the affine coisotropic relation part, this is no problem at all. But neither this calculus nor, nor the, the category of affine relations has an interpretation in Hilbert space because of this um, lack of cups and caps or lack of capacity. But could you interpret it in like non-standard? Maybe. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, it's a lot more complicated for sure. Thank you for the very nice talk. I wonder, um, you said one of the open problem is the characterization of stabilizer circuits when the dimension is not prime. I wonder, um, a naive thought would be using the prime decomposition to decompose a system into subsystems of prime dimensions and then apply the rules that you found to the subsystems. Is there um, a reason that this is not trivial? Like, what do you think? Um, there, I mean, there's one reason why uh, this is uh, at least the proofs that we've made in this paper are not going to apply immediately. And that is that these, um, 
uh, these multipliers that I, I was saying for, for representing multi-edges um, play a very important part, uh, and in particular they play an important part as a unitary operator acting on graph states. And the problem is that when you take you decompose your non-prime dimension along its prime factors, um, some of these uh, th these guys are basically just multiplication in the, the field. These are no longer going to be invertible, and so they no longer admit a unitary representation. Now it might be that you can uh, just sort of do without and impose that they should only be um, part of the the group of units, but at least. Uh, you, you, some care is needed in generalizing the proofs, and they don't sort of immediately work. Sorry, what's the last sentence? I said at least some some care is needed in uh, in, in in doing the proofs again, and it doesn't immediately generalize in in, in a completely obvious way, right? Oh, okay. Any. Let's thank the speaker again. I'm going to talk about um, the result of a master project um, by uh, Alex Townsend Teague when he was uh, still at Oxford, um, co supervised by Alex. And um, now the work is on that archive link. And it's, it's about how to efficiently kill stabilizer, cute read spiders. Um, basically graphical goddess manil for um cutrit version um and yeah we did this in the autumn of 2020 um and uh, we're talking about this today so i'm going to flash through the qubit stuff because uh we all know it very well uh, but uh, this is what we generalized so basically okay uh, i have to say alex did all of the heavy lifting here um so qubits, we know the calculus is generated by the two spiders. We draw the Hadamard edges by uh, blue dashed lines, as uh, Alex and John and uh, who else is on that paper? Alex, John, Ross, and Benoit. Right. It's it's the graph theoretic simplification of circuits paper. Simon. 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 I'm sorry. Wrong French guy. Wrong French guy. Uh, good. Now this is on YouTube forever. Um, Okay, so complete rewrites for, for Zx qubits, that's the calculus. Um, and the point is that uh, we can go graph-like, as we heard in the previous talk, uh, how they did it for, for, um, for higher uh, dimensional things, and this is, this is very important. We want to have this for qubits. So the idea here is that you can color change everything, and now everything can be green spiders. Uh, with blue Hadamard edges, right? Um, and you can always do that. And so there's there's two important um, rewrites. There's two important operations. Um, so there's a local complementation you can do about a vertex. And the idea is that you have to superimpose a Z2 weighted um, graph on the neighbors of that edge. And wh what I mean is that wherever there is an edge, you add it. And whenever, wherever there isn't a... Uh, yeah, wherever there isn't an edge, you add it, and wherever there is an edge, you take it away. And this is how this operation um, uh, looks like for graph states. So if you, if you do it on a graph state, then you have to stick some uh, Pauli phases on the legs of the graph state, and, and, and then it's, it's valid, like the semantics is the same. So there's another operation, which is a composition of three local complementations, which is uh, something we will need to. So it's called a pivot about an edge um, which is uh, which is um, labeled by vertices u and v, and it's it's three local complementations in a row about u, about v, and then about about u again. And this is what it looks like for for a graph state, where basically you need you need to um, to exchange the two uh, edges. You swap them and you stick Hadamards on them. Sorry, so you swap the two vertices. You stick a Hadamard on them, and then you have to. Uh, to apply a complete graph between uh, three sets of uh, neighbors. One set is the uh, shared neighborhood, the other one is the exclusive neighborhood of one vertex, the other one is the exclusive neighborhood of the other ed uh, ver vertex. And anyway, this is what the diagram looks like. This is all, all in that paper over there um, with the wrong French guy. And then from these two, so you, you need to use these to get to 
these efficient, uh, well, these, these rewrites that apply for stabilizer diagrams. Stabilizer diagrams means all the phases of multiples of pi over 2. And so the first rule you arrive at by using local complementation and it removes spiders that have pi over 2 in them. You remove a spider and you add more edges. That's, that's the moral of the story. If you use the pivot, you can remove pairs of spiders that have multiples of pi on them. And by introduces again, introduce again a bunch of edges on their neighborhoods uh, because you use pivot. So the idea here is that if you have a big spider web uh, with pi over twos and pies only, then uh, you can use these two to efficiently rewrite it. And uh, here I care about uh, diagrams that are closed. So there, there's no open legs, so they're scalars. But um, all of this generalizes to circuits, to if you want to simplify them and then do extraction or whatever. Um, so these are the, the two spider ki killing rules for stabilizer Q-T sp spiders. It's, it's the moral of the story. And we want to generalize these two to Q-treats. That, that's the point of, of this talk. So Q-treat generators are these two spiders. Now they, each one carries two phases. And we call stabilizer um, spiders, as we heard in the previous talk, the ones that have multiples of 2 pi over 3 now. So the third root of unity is carried by, by the, the labels. Um, so yeah, we, we built on Harney's work for this. Um, this is the calculus that was presented by Harney for Q-treats. I'm scared of this stuff, by the way. I mean, look at this. Um, right, and then one of the key things that we had to take care of is to make it look graph-like, because, um, yeah, as we heard also before, that snake is, is uh, it's not a nice snake. I mean, you cannot just uh, make it an identity. There's a, there's a cost to it. But um, if you go to a Hadamard edge type notation like before, so we, we put for Hadamard a blue and a blue edge, and for Hadamard a joint edge, we put purple edge. Uh, we can use these rewrites here to to make everything look graph-like. So everything is green, and the edges are all blue or purple. And and then we can um, take what Harney did for local complementation, and and basically. Here I'm showing you how local complementation works for the cases where we have two um, um, when I'm doing a local complementation about a vertex which shares only uh, two vertices as a neighbor. And what's happening is that if you have the same color on the edges that connect to the neighbors, you add an alpha uh, weight on, 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 the, on the edge that connects the neighbors. So W and alpha here are Z3 um, labels, and the, you know I, I add them on the on the edge. So if if the label of the yellow box is um, is um, is one, then it's a blue edge, and if it's two, it's a purple edge. And there's a Z3 addition on the edges. Um, if they have different colors, the um, the edges that connect the neighbors of A, then you subtract the the weight. So this is called an alpha-weighted local uh, complementation because that's how it acts on the adjacency matrix of the graph. So in general, this is what happens if you do it on a graph state, like before. If you do it on a graph state, then you have to stick these stabilizer phases on the legs. Um, and uh, right, stabilizer here, mean it's always stabilizer because the notation is that um, Whenever I have an integer labeling the spiders, it's it's what multiple of pi over three I'm, uh, two pi over three I'm, uh, um, I mean. So the idea is that uh, so uh, yeah the the novelty is that um, we saw how this generalizes to pivot. So this is what Alex uh, one one of the things that Alex proved is is how you do three local complementations in a row and what you get when when you want to define a pivot. And since every pivot has a weight on it, when we have to define what, what Alex called an alpha pivot, a proper alpha pivot or a pivot, and it's like a pivot with a weight for vertex u minus a weight on vertex v, a weight on uh, vertex u again, and you get this, and this is how it acts on a graph state. So again, you do the pivot on the graph, underline graph of the graph state, and you, you stick the stabilizer uh, uh, phases on the corresponding neighborhoods. Of, of, um, of the graph that the pivot involves. We also had to define this monstrosity, which is uh, a decorated uh, bank box, that we call it. Um, this is only well-defined when the internal thing in the, in the box is, uh, is a single spider. And, 
and it's labeled with that edge. For example, here I'm giving, yeah, I'm giving you the example where the label is a dashed blue. So what the thing does is it unfolds. So it's like it, it, it describes a family of diagrams where um, uh, you get um, it's a family of diagrams up to some number, and it just copies the diagram many times. And every time it puts a complete graph with these edges of the label between the things that are unfolded. Uh, that's what it does. And this is needed so that we have a compact representation of our rewrites um, later because they get a bit unwieldy. So um, these are the spider killing cutrit uh, rewrites that we get from the, using uh, the local complementation. So that one kills spiders that have uh, the same multiple of pi, uh, 2 pi over 3 on, on the two labels of them. And these two rules uh, kill spiders that have zero and then another integer. Um, right? So these two we get from local complementation. And this one uh, we get from using the pivot. So this removes pairs of spiders that have this pattern of integers. So m and minus m, the opposite, in their labels. So we remove the pair and we add a bunch of complete graphs between them with different Hadamard weights. And it looks like that. And, um, and then we, we, did, we made a cute observation uh, from knot theory which I will describe very, very quickly. So the idea is that um, th there is a quantity from knot theory called the Jones polynomial, and it's a polynomial, it's a Laurent polynomial, one complex variable, and it doesn't change when you deform the knot, like you get it from a knot. And the idea is that um, if two knots have uh, a different polynomial, then they are topologically different. I mean, it doesn't go backwards, it's not a complete invariant, but it goes this way. The idea is that there is a mapping from, um, from this very nice paper from 92 by Wu, which connects statistical mechanics and knot theory. And the idea is that from a knot, you get a graph out. And on the graph, you put a statistical mechanical model on Q state spins. And the partition function of that model with specifically engineered interactions such that this thing is a um, not invariant. The idea is that uh, the partition function is uh, proportional to the Jones polynomial evaluated at t of q, where q is the number of states in the spin. Um, long story short, you get a diagram out if you want to represent the partition function. And the diagram is uh, green spiders of q-dimensional legs connected through these matrices, plus or minus, depending on the crossing of the knot. Um, anyway, uh, the matrix representation of this plus-minus box is, is that matrix over there, all ones, and the diagonal has this um, evaluation point to some power, minus one or plus one. And the idea is that um, the cute observation we made using the stabilizer uh, uh, Zx and, uh, for qubits and qtrits, rewrites, the, the cute observation we made is that it is known that this problem is hard, um, as in evaluating the Jones polynomial is hard, except at these specific points, the specific roots of unity, which happen to be when the dimension of the legs carried by uh, the wires in this diagram is uh, one, it's totally trivial, and then two, three, and four. And this is what happens. Um, right, and we see this from our calculus because this box looks like um, stabilizer. They, it, they look like spiders, either qubits or qtrits with stabilizer phases in them. And the idea is that um, for whatever knot, you get a stabilizer diagram out, and then you can efficiently kill all the, the spiders. And this is like a different way to see this known result from complexity that, that this problem is easy at these specific points. Anywhere else, you don't get a stabilizer diagram. You get some whatever ZX diagram, and then you're, well, you get some random tensor network, and then you don't know what to do. So yeah, to summarize, we main result is these two rules for how to efficiently kill stabilizer q diagrams and and also this one for removing um, yeah for single spiders for pairs of spiders yeah that's it thank you very much thank you thank you any questions So, do you have a, a formal proof that for other Q, you will never be able to write it as a stabilizer, or is this just an intuition? 
Uh, well, there are proofs that this this pro you mean for the for the Jones, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this problem is. Um, I can give you the reference for for why it's sharply hard, but um, I mean, when you see the problem being easy, you can see it's easy. But I, I don't think you can easily prove that something is hard. Uh, uh, I mean, how do you show that you cannot? I don't know. Like, no, maybe no. this way it's hard, but maybe some genius finds another way. It's all of these things that are not believed to be easy, right? But um, but at least if you if you show that those boxes are not in any stabilizer not, fragment, yeah. you, you know this method at, le at least would not, will not work. Yeah, yeah, you can see like um, if it's if it's a five-dimensional thing, you can see that it it doesn't break into. Uh, whatever the other calculus says, the spiders look like uh, with two pi over five, for example, in the face. Like it, it will look some. It doesn't compile like the stabilizers. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any more questions? I've got, I have a question. Have you have you looked at socket extraction? Oh yeah, I should have mentioned this. Good point. So future work would be, yeah, something like this. Someone should just <laughs> take this, uh, clean the Clifford stuff around uh, whatever the T-gate is for cutrids, or the hard gates, and uh, yeah, try to do extraction for simplification of cutrid circuits. Like one application of this one, what you want to simplify is not like a scalar thing. Yeah, good point. Yeah, exactly. Maybe you can shout and I can repeat. Yeah, shout. Sure. No, some people are working on Qtrit hardware, actually. There is a group in Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> are you building hardware? Oh, nice. Okay, there you go. Yeah, so Lee also works on Qtrits, so pick her brain, yeah. Yeah, more Qtrits more later. Yeah. <laughs> Qtrits are supposed to have an advantage because the local Hilbert space is bigger, and some people say it, they're faster to, I don't know, scramble and move around quantum information, but I, I imagine engineering-wise they're... A nightmare. I mean, qubits are hard, so <laughs> what can I tell you? Yeah, let's thank the speaker again. Hello, everyone. I'm Leah, and today I'm talking, as Richie said, about this paper. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge Alex. Xu Sheng, a PhD student in physics working on the hardware, uh, Alex Cowton, and Will Simmons. Some motivation for this work. Um, so uh, we're interested in the problem of exact synthesis for Qtrits, and it just, just has been an interest in uh, my PhD research. And a lot of the past work has been on ternary classical reversible gates, so that's not really something that's quantum uh, uh, takes really advantage of the quantum properties. Um, so um, you can have finite gate sets for Qtrits, just like you can for qubits, uh, which are approximately universal. So Clifford plus T generalizes to prime dimension qubits, including Qtrits for D equals three. And you, uh, I've also looked a bit at Clifford plus R, which is uh, called the Qtrit metaplectic gate set, which uh, is also approximately universal. Um, but those two gate sets are both generated by a set of four gates, and uh, we wanted to know what about if you have a gate set with as many, uh, uh, infinitely many gates. So uh, the native gate set for the generators of ZX calculus, you can consider that to be Clifford plus single qubit ZNX phases. And for a qubit ZX, it's also the same, so um, prime dimension. So yeah, you also have Clifford plus phases is the gate set of interest for this talk. <laughs> To quickly go over Qtrit CX calculus, um, but the talks before me did a very good job of this background. Uh, first, uh, you have your Heisenberg veil polys. Uh, so these are how X and Z are defined. Um, and we use the X plus one there uh, just to note there's other X gates as well, um, like permutation X gates. And uh, your X basis states for Qtrits look like this, so they're all equal superpositions of the computational or Z basis states where omega here is the third root of unity, so e to the two pi i over three. Um, 
and uh, you still have your uh, your um, unit and <laughs> um, monoidal units, and then uh, you also have this uh, flux symmetry that Robert mentioned and defined in his talk, where it gives you covers only topology matters and only connectivity matters, where you can bend any wires uh, such that you can treat inputs and outputs on the same footing rather than keeping track of that. Here's the definitions of the Qtrit Z spider in general. And we're following Harney's convention here of labeling it with two phases, alpha and beta, where um, alpha and beta are powers of uh, omega or the third root of unity. And it turns out just specific to the Qtrit case, or at least it's convenient that uh, in the Qtrit case, if you have a phase which is a power of integer power of omega, it's a Clifford and in. Yeah, and uh, non-integer powers of omega are non-Clifford. There's the corresponding x spider in the flex symmetric Qtrit ZX calculus. So uh, there's a slight difference between this one and the ones that uh, Constantinos just presented because of the flex symmetry, which we'll see uh, in two slides. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, because now you have three uh, basis states, in Z basis states, then you have all X gates, which are permutations of that, and there's five of them. Uh, so this shows the relations between how to say the X12 gate, which is also the flex symmetric single spider with no phase, uh, one input, one output. That uh, is, um, we call it X12 because it maps one state to two state, two to one, and zero to zero. Um, so, uh, just like in qubits, in prime dimension qubits, you can generalize Clifford plus T. And so uh, this is Clifford CX for qubits. This is the S gate for qubits, and this is the H gate for qubits. This H gate is uh, non -self, is not self inverse as it is for qubits, but H to the four is identity. So um, you can also uh, add to these three gates that generate the Cliffords. You can add a uh, the fourth gate, um, any non-Clifford fourth gate should give you uni approximate universality. Specifically, uh, the most well-studied would be Clifford plus T, where this is the q generalization of the T gate. So um, here we have also presented the q ZX calculus. This is of, uh, this is of, so this is complete for the stabilizer fragment. Uh, so we took Harney's rules and also made its flux symmetric according to Tichuan's uh, Only Topology Matters paper. And we also made an attempt to uh, eliminate any rules we felt were redundant. So actually, other than a few of the rules here, this looks quite similar um, to the presentation for qubits. And I would say even the Qtrit presentation has some more similarities to qubits than other uh, prime dimensions. So uh, there's two color change rules, as uh, as was mentioned. and. Uh, um, you will still have an Euler decomposition and some cool things. Uh, something that when you go to flex symmetry formal axiomatization that you have a cost of is that uh, your X spider fusion now becomes a Harvestman fusion equation. So you can see that the fusion has uh, these single one input, one output pink spiders, which are not the identity. They're the X12 permutation map for cube traits. So that's a cost, but you can freely translate between the flex symmetric and non-flex symmetric versions whenever you want. Um, and the flex symmetric is way easier to work with. Um, so in this talk is about phase gadgets. So um, in this conference, we've had a lot of uh, presentations in this year and past years about the usefulness of phase gadgets. Um, so this is the qubit, two qubit phase gadget. Uh, so alpha is a real number phase, uh, mod 2 pi. Um, and for qtrits, uh, we can simplify uh, in qtrit zx calculus if we take every single generator in the qubit decomposition and just uh, translate them to the qtrit version. So the first question is, whatever the qtrit version is, uh, what does the gate look like? This is the, just a really short rewrite. and. Um, you get something that looks quite similar or a generalization of how the qubit one looks. Um, that simplification. For phase gadgets, uh, we now want to know what that gate that we just drew just by translating uh, 
one by one each generator in the decomposition, what that kit does. So uh, let's have x be an integer that's mod 3, so 0, 1, or 2. And so this represents all the computational basis states being plugged in uh, to the gate that we just had on the previous slide. And what the map is, is this xy that maps to omega to the alpha x plus y mod 3 in the exponent, where omega is, again, the third root of unity. So um, we can also generalize that to any number of Q-traits uh, like this. You, so the idea of graphically manipulating phase gadgets with Q-trait CX calculus still holds soundly. <laughs> For um, Q-bits, there's this connection between phase gadgets and controlled gates. So this is the decomposition that's in PQP of a controlled Z alpha gate or Z alpha phase gate, uh, where alpha can be some parameter of it's an arbitrary phase, and this, that's what it looks like for qubits. And for qtrits, um, if we just attempt to take the exact same construction, we run into the issue that uh, if, your goal, if your goal is to control on a single trit value, that doesn't quite work. So um, in this case, working out all the possibilities, you get this alpha plus beta phase applied when uh, the factor phase when you have the control is one and when the control is two. So you can't build a, just like that, you can't build a gate of the form ket2 controlled um, or single trip valued controlled uh, arbitrary z phase gate where the z phase gate has two parameters. So um, instead, uh, we doubled the construction and showed that you can always find an assignment for these internal phases of this decomposition such that uh, you can build any ket2 controlled z phase gate. It's just a system of four linear equations. We can generalize to any trit string controls. So in this case, uh, we actually, this is even um, polynomial and gate count. So um, just by controlling the CX, the Clifford CX gates or some gates, and also controlling the top phase on the uh, second to last, so the, uh, the q trait right above the target one. And uh, fast for how to build controlled CX gates, <laughs> um, just a plug for our other paper. This is a decomposition of a few years before I was born, a qubit multiple control Toffoli uh, unitary construction uh, in polynomial gate counts. You can use these. And uh, how to do this in polynomial or efficient gate count for Q-traits wasn't known until, uh, well, until uh, John and I worked on it this year, which I'll present next week. Uh, and uh, the paper's title is Constructing All Q-Trait Controlled Clifford Plus T Gates in Q Clifford Plus T uh, Unitarily in Polynomial Gate Count. So we go beyond multiple control Toffleys for, Clif for uh, Q-Traits and even cover Clifford, all possible controlled Clifford Plus T Gates. Um, for controlled gates, uh, we can also have a different notion of control generalizing it from phase polynomials. Uh, so in the qubit case, you can view a qubit multiple controlled Toffley in two ways. One is that you could see it as being controlled on single bit string, and the other is that you could think of it as being controlled on multiplication uh, mod 2. So the, in the bit case, there's only one value of a bit string such that multiplying every bit bitwise gives you 1 and not 0, which is when they're all 1. But for uh, higher dimensions, so traits here in this case, uh, that's not the case anymore. So we define something called a phase multiplier. Um, uh, before we get to that, I'll first show this x and y uh, can be zero. If in this diagram, with being zero or one, you can trace, or you can not sorry, you can uh, follow the values of how the uh, value of bits either being zero or one is stored on the wire. So this C not gate here adds or basically takes the uh, XOR of x and y, and you uncompute that after you've applied the z phase. Uh, so this gives us x times y in the exponential. On the left-hand side and right-hand side, I've converted these two phase polynomials um, form. And uh, we observed that uh, if you have, start with uh, the, this uh, case of the binomial theorem, but now you restrict x and y to be bits, and you, uh, you uh, mod over those relations specific for bits, then uh, you get 
um, you recover, you can recover exactly the equation that was used mod two to construct this. So a bit confusing here is that there's two types of addition going on or subtraction in here in this equation. The x or is mod two, and then the plus and minus here are not mod two, so they're over the real numbers. So it's a mapping from bit functions to real numbers. And uh, we can do the same for Q-trits. Um, uniquely to Q-trits, we can do start with the same starting polynomial from uh, the binomial theorem, and uh, this is what we get. Um, it looks uglier at first because it's no longer linear. However, we observe that q uh, you can, um, one squared is one mod two, three, and two squared mod is also one mod three. So we also get uh, a way that you can explicitly build uh, the idea of x squared for x being a trick if x is already on the wire. And so uh, we actually get a construction for the q -trit phase multiplier that looks exactly, almost exactly like it does in the qubit case. There's one really notable and quite significant difference is that here, now the phases we're dealing with, the size of them is alpha. So we don't get alpha over two like we would in the qubit case, where we have smaller and smaller phases, the more controls that we add um, for our phase multipliers. So our propositions uh, from the paper is that we can construct these unitarily and ancilla free with a gate set that only consists of phases of size alpha or minus alpha with q trick Clifford plus t. And uh, this allows us to do uh, exactly construct any diagonal q trick unitary. In particular, the case where you're restricting to the 0, 1 subspace is exact emulation of the qubit uh, any multiple controlled phase gates. Um, for the specific case of the qubit CCZ gate, we can do a bit better. Um, so here is the, uh, on the top, here's some, uh, let's say we want to do a generic Ket2 controlled Z gate for any phase, uh, and um, in the bottom, that's how you can construct a Toffoli, uh, so a CCZ gate, where now the bottom is the qubit Z gate. And it turns out, uh, we show in our paper, how you can do this with the Clifford plus R Kitchen Metaplectic gate set, uh, in Silla free and unitarily with R count three. Why we were really excited about that is because um, in the qubit case, the best you can do is for qubit Clifford plus T, for example, is four T gates. Um, if you are non-unitarily, so you use post-selection or some uh, classical uh, gates condition on classical measurement outcomes, or you have seven T gates unitarily. So therefore, this is a new minimum on the number of single qubit non-Clifford gates to construct any type of qubit CCZ gate. As a conclusion, we construct two different types of multiple controls, q z phase and with how to you can also make it x phase gates. And this allows us to construct any multi q diagonal unitary in this Clifford plus phases gate set. There we find a better construction for qubit CCZ with um, q emulation. And for future work, um, this definition of phase multiplier is, um, we believe it's exactly what uh, you could use to generalize qubit ZH calculus to Q prime dimension qubits. And uh, that in the qubit case, that was corresponding to Toffoli plus Hadamard. We also want to know how to build and solve for phase polynomials more efficiently and uh, have some questions about uh, polys and how they generalize to qubits in a way that could also, uh, you could exponentiate them and have a reasonable interpretation. Um, I end my slide by showing recent works. Um, so the first one here is, uh, is a um, collaboration with uh, the Peter Leakes group in the physics department at Oxford, where um, uh, my collaborator, Xu Sheng, a PhD student, uh, gave a talk at APS March meeting about how we simulated parameters for, uh, and gave a, con gave a construction at the pulse level for implementing arbitrary ZZ interactions, so AKA two Qubit phase gadgets on, um, on their superconducting hardware. Thank you everyone, and um, I'm, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, have you got Have you got any questions? Thanks for the nice talk, Leah. Um, you uh, You gave a construction, I, I think, where you can implement a uh, this phase multiplier gate. Uh, with the same single qubit phase as you want for the multiplier, right? Which is different from the qubit case where you need to go alpha over two. 
Uh, does this mean that the phase multiplier gate with an S-like phase is actually Clifford in Q-trits? Um, yeah, it does. So actually, this was something we pointed out in our paper. A uh, past paper had believed that you have to, that that gate, exact gate that you described, I think they believed that it was in the nth level of the Clifford hierarchy for n number of Q-trits, but we just have it in the Clifford um, Clifford level, yeah. Maybe shout and then. Which slide? Uh, the se I think it's second to the last. Right here. Do you mean for this uh, two controlled ZAT gate, it is in the QTRIT system? Um, I said that this KET2 control, so it's a KET2 controlled qubit Z gate. So as you see on the top, the E stands for emulation. So the left hand thing is emulated by the thing on the right, which is some more general. So you don't care in the middle case, the question marks are wild cards, where you don't care exactly what value that takes as long as there exists some value that's valid. Sorry, I was um, wondering about the bottom one. On the left hand side, it's a class, uh, sorry, it's a, it's a qubit system, multiply controls that. And on the right hand side, this is a Qtrit gate, right? Yeah, so if you plug in, uh, plug in uh, gates, uh, if you plug in states that are in the zero one subspace into the right hand side, you'll always get a qubit out. Oh, okay, thank you. Okay. Can I see it? So I noticed that in um, some of your equations, you ended up having um, x squared appear in, in the exponent, um, which reminded me of the other version of the, the Cupid um, ZX calculus we saw earlier. Have you thought about kind of translations between these two um, different versions? Uh, although I'm not sure if I understand the question. I. Let me give a shot. So I think uh, you mentioned there's x squared in the exponent. So as long as the uh, thing that is being exponentiated is in integers mod 3, it's just a matter of us getting that value onto a wire and then applying this x squared phase gate. So there's the, the reason why the propositions have Clifford plus t is because we built ket2 controlled qubit, oh, sorry, ket2 controlled qubit x gates using the using three t gates. Yeah, so, sorry, that wasn't what I asked. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, so what I was wondering about was, um, so you've kind of used Hani's parameterization for the phases, um, and uh, Robert presented a different parameterization for the phases, um, which I think is um, something to do with like a linear and a quadratic part in the exponent. Yeah, um, that's and correct. And you've also occasionally got quadratic things appearing in the exponent. So I was just wondering whether you'd looked at the translation between these two different um, versions of Qtrids at X calculus. Um. Yeah, that's exactly what we did here. So the this <laughs> the main point of our paper is that we translate between uh, x times y and uh, some sum of uh, additive and squared terms without any multiplication. So we translate between multiplication and uh, other additions and squares mod three. Um, did that yeah, answer? Maybe your... let's let's take oh, a look. Okay, Thanks. we'll <laughs> talk about this offline. Okay, I think we can have yeah one quick question. Uh, thanks, Leah. So the it's a pretty common error mode for a qubit to get excited into the third level of the, the thing. So I was looking at this these pictures you showed of um, doing qubit operations on qtrids, and I was wondering if it's a, a realistic idea to use operations like that to try and have build some circuits which are resilient against that particular error mode. Mm. Um, uh, from the hardware's perspective, so was, I will say that we, with Clifford plus T, we're still dealing with something that is potentially fault tolerant, conceivably fault tolerant. And so in that case, uh, if you had a low enough hardware error rate, of course it is harder the more, you, the more dimensions you have in your base system. But in that case, you would still uh, have a 
valid computational model that can deal with error if you have a low enough natural error. Um, there is an issue with uh, with this kind of parameterized compilation. So uh, I I do agree that when uh, because uh, I don't think that I think the paper is not really out. So it's between uh, our group here or like UC Berkeley's group that works on making ZZ interactions on QChits. The hardware is not quite there yet. We have the proposals and we can do the gates in principle, but it's uh, there's a lot of leakage error and other kinds of hardware error to consider. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, let's thank Leah and all the speakers. Uh, yeah. <laughs>